Welcome to Using Mathematical Routines That Honor and Develop Expert Learners. I am Mark Alcorn, along with my colleague, Andre Mendeville from the San Diego County Office of Education. Audrey and I work with teachers and administrators in supporting the success of all mathematics learners in San Diego County. As former elementary and secondary teachers, we have been working to leverage the Universal Design for Learning guidelines as a tool to support students in learning mathematics. This session is designed as a one hour learning experience. Although you will find this video is not one hour long, there are multiple opportunities for you to pause the video in order to individualize your learning. And we'll let you know about those places as we go through our session with you today. As we have been working to implement UDL over the past few years, a question has surfaced. Why is UDL not a widespread practice? Even though universal design for learning is not a new approach, we have noticed a lack of integration between UDL and the teaching and learning of specific content areas. In some cases, UDL remains a theoretical construct to educators without visible and practical connections to the pedagogy of each content area. The lack of integration of UDL into the planning and delivery of daily instruction is especially true in the content area of mathematics. In addition, many of the publications and examples of universal design for learning are in the content areas most connected to English language arts, while implementation models and resources for mathematics are scarce. We believe mathematical instructional routines can serve as a bridge for teachers to use UDL as an approach to better implement the teaching and learning of mathematics. In our workshop today, our intention is for you to walk away more empowered with strong connections to UDL and mathematics and how we can ensure that each and every student experiences success in math. With this in mind, here are our, our session outcomes. First, we will learn how implementing instructional routines in mathematics can provide access and opportunity for each and every student. Next, we will learn how to honor students and build them up as expert learners in mathematics. We will prioritize reducing the association of the mathematics classroom as a place of fear. And finally, we will identify a next step to use UDL and mathematics routines to improve access and opportunity in mathematics in your school, district, or classroom. A book that has informed our thinking regarding implementing universal design for learning is Andra Tisha Fritz-Gerald's Anti-Racism and Universal Design for Learning. This quote will ground us in the why and the sense of urgency in our work today. Traditional systems that perpetuate institutional racism and block on-ramps to learning are designed for a mythical average learner, one who is white, privileged, at grade level, and self-regulated. This quote relates across the educational spectrum, but especially rings true as we consider the traditional math classroom. Each phrase identifies a reality that is still present in many math classrooms. To set a learning goal for this session today, we'd ask you to consider why you clicked on this session. What about the title or description interested you and made you wanna learn more? We recognize that each person is coming to the session with unique interests and wonderings. So we would like you to customize your learning throughout the session based on the question you are interested in learning about, thereby setting a learning goal for the session. Which question helps focus your learning? How do we honor students and their identities in a math classroom? 
How do we reduce fear in a math classroom? How do we ensure student identity is not a predictor of becoming an expert math learner? Or you might have another question you want to explore. In just a moment, we'll ask you to pause to consider, name, and record your learning goal for this session. We'll give you time throughout this session to go back and refer to your learning goal. So take some time to ensure you have clarity around what question you're trying to answer or the learning goal you'd like to set for the session. Go ahead and pause to do so. Now that you have a learning goal, it's important for us to set the stage for the context of talking about mathematics. Think for a moment about how you would describe your experience in math. What words describe your experience in math? We'd like to show you two wordles or word pictures of how some other people responded to the same question. Where do your words appear? Do the words you came up with fit more on the left or the right? What about your students? What words would your students use to describe their experience in math? For many students, especially students whose identities are perpetually marginalized, the words on the left describe their experience with math. The words on the right are actually words for mathematicians. Tracy Zager in her book, Becoming the Math Teacher You Wish You'd Had, describes the difference between the math we often engage in in the classroom and the math mathematicians engage in. The bullets here um, describe those behaviors and are the chapter titles of her book. Mathematicians take risks, make mistakes, are precise, rise to a challenge, ask questions, connect ideas, use intuition, reason, prove, and work together and alone. The narrow definition many of us have held about what math is by nature excludes students. When we look at what math really is, not just the math we've done in school for decades, but what mathematicians engage in, the definition is much broader and actually much more inclusive. Which of these chapter titles, the behaviors of a mathematician, resonate most, most with you? Which are surprising? Which ones are you wondering about? It's important to take a moment to develop a shared understanding of what math is. You'll see here on the screen articles and videos that we found that can help you to explore one or more of the behaviors of a mathematician a little further. We invite you to pick one that was surprising or one that you are wondering about and explore the article or video linked on the slide. You can access these slides at the website bit.ly forward slash capital M A T H underscore capital U capital D capital L. Take 10 minutes or so and pause now to explore one or more of those behaviors. Okay, let's begin with our first math routine, same and different. Take a moment to consider these two images. What's the same and what's different? Pause and come up with at least one example of something you think is the same about the two images and one example of something that is different about the two images. Mark, what's one thing that you noticed that was the same? Well, one thing that I noticed is the same is that they both have purple and gray. Hmm. I noticed that they are both broken into squares. Oh, that's and true. I also noticed that both are square shapes. Oh, yes. Oh, that's right. They're, those are both true. That's really cool. Uh, I also noticed that the purple makes up half the area of the total square. Oh, that's neat. Um, let's see. There also seems to be an equal number of purple and gray shapes in both of the, both of the images. Ah, I had not noticed that. That's really cool. Oh, here's one. The ratio of gray to purple is the same in both shapes. Nice. Well, Mark, I'm curious about one of the things you might have noticed that was different. Ah, well, let's see. 
Oh, one is broken into fourths and the other one's broken into eighths. Nice. Let's, um, let's see, there are two purple shapes in one and the other one has four purple shapes. Yeah, very true. Uh, one has symmetry diagonally and the other has symmetry horizontally. Cool. The left has squares and the right has triangles. Mm -hmm. Oh, look at this one. If you translate the top half of the square onto the bottom, one will end up completely shaded and the other will end up only half shaded purple. Oh, that's neat. Well, now this isn't exactly how the routine would run because we're asynchronous on a recorded session and there are only two of us chatting instead of a group of students. So let's look at a couple of the nuances of how this routine works. First of all, the routine is called same and different, but it's also sometimes called same but different. It can begin with a question like, what do you notice? Or in the case that we did, what's the same and what's different? Listing things that you found are the same in both images as well as that what are different in both images is the crux of both, most of the routine. This can include drawings or notating the images, pointing or physical demonstrations, as well as words. It can begin as individuals, then move to partners and eventually move to a group or a class conversation. Let's return to this idea of mathematics for a moment. Which of these behaviors did you engage in during the same and different routine? I noticed that Mark and I were working on being precise with our language and took risks with our noticings. Which of the behaviors do you think your students would engage in if you tried this routine in a class? Would they take risks and make mistakes? Use intuition? Maybe prove that their conjecture was accurate? Well, let's take a look. How does this routine of same and different build expert learners? Well, here's a few ways. First of all, it reduces barriers and provides access for student thinking. And here's some ways that it does that. There are visual representations. There are multiple access points. There are multiple solutions. And this idea of same and different, that actual frame, it actually can be extended to other content areas and life situations. Another way that the same and different routine builds expert learners is that it honors student identity. The routine is accepting of different perspectives. As you notice, when Audrey and I engage in the routine as participants, we are each challenged not only to listen to each other's perspective, but also make an, an attempt to understand each other's perspectives. Each person's identity is honored as we honor each unique perspective. The routine also leverages social and cultural capital. The underlying concept of compare and contrast at the root of this routine has a universal access across cultures. Students can offer their rationale based on their cultural capital. This capital might include visual connections to other contexts outside of school. In this example, the concept of patterns through quilting and art could come up as a personal connection. Each person's identity is honored as they are encouraged to share connections to their lives and cultures outside of school and outside of the school math context. This routine embraces a collectivist approach to mathematics. In her book, Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain, Soretta Hammond writes about the two societal views of individualist cultures and collectivist cultures. Traditionally, mathematics in this country has been taught with an individualist mindset, combined with the belief that only certain individuals are destined to be proficient mathematics students. Each person is honored in this routine as ideas are shared by each and every student as a collection of the class's thinking. And that leads us to the last part of student identity. This routine grows collective thinking as each person contributes their thinking. 
In this routine, a collectivist approach is emphasized, which allows the diversity of ideas to lead the whole group to discover new ideas and understandings about mathematics. Each person's identity is honored as students come to realize that the sum of each of their thinking together as a collective is stronger than any one individual. As we consider this idea of identity and how it connects to the collective student community, read this quote with me from Paulo Tan and his colleagues from the book, Humanizing Disability in Mathematics Education. Mathematics needs disabled students rather than disabled students need mathematics. We need everyone's identity present and each student's voice heard in our learning because it makes us better. We lose something for each person who is excluded. That's a collectivist mindset. However, in order to include everyone, we need to reduce the association between mathematics and fear. Think back to the words that you use to describe your experience with math. For many students, fear is a regular part of their daily interaction with the content area of mathematics. This same and different routine can reduce the association between mathematics and fear by accepting and welcoming students, allowing them to take risks and making them feel comfortable and making mistakes. Secondly, this routine reduces the expectation for the idea of there being one right answer. It eliminates the guess what's in the teacher's head questions. It builds a collectivist culture. It sets an expectation so that each perspective offers new insight for the group. In just a moment, we'll ask you to pause to consider the learning you have done so far in this session. What understanding have you built so far towards your learning question? Please pause the recording, take a, take a few minutes to write, record, and consider what you've gained so far. As we look at how does this routine, the same and different routine, and the implementation of this routine reduce barriers, we want to first take a moment to clarify what we mean by the routine and its implementation. To do this, we would like to separate out the task or the routine and its implementation just briefly. When we talk about the task or routine, we mean the problem, exercise, or question that students will be engaged in thinking about. You can think about this like the task here on the page that says shade in a part of the large square, then identify how much of the whole square you shaded. Or you can think of it as the purple and gray squares we were just looking at in the same and different routine. When we talk about the implementation, we're thinking of these things as the teacher moves that surrounded the task or routine. These would be the questions that were asked, whether or not students worked together or alone. If the teacher had students write things down or record as students shared out loud, those types of behaviors. We have mentioned some ideas about how to reduce barriers for students to support them in accessing mathematics through these instructional routines. The UDL guidelines is a good resource to evaluate the task and to inform the implementation. The UDL guidelines can be used as a tool to evaluate the type of task, in this case, a routine, to ensure there are options to reduce barriers for students so that they are able to successfully engage in the mathematics. Here on the screen, you see the representation network selected. The same and different routine has qualities within this network that lower barriers in perception language and comprehension. The UDL guidelines can also be used as a tool to ev evaluate the implementation and inform the implementation of a task, in this case, a routine. 
in order to ensure that there's options to reduce the barriers for students so they can thereby successfully engage in the mathematics. As you look on the screen, you see the action and expression network selected. Using UDL to plan for implementation of this routine, same and different, can reduce barriers in expression and communication within that particular network. The examples I provided were just a couple areas of intersection. Where do you see connections between the task, same and different, and the implementation of the task with those two networks and with the task in that particular network as well? Please pause to take time to consider this. Okay, let's jump into another instructional routine at this time, which one doesn't belong? This time we wanna provide you with some resources that, so that you can customize it for a particular grade span or topic that you're interested in exploring. So here we go. Which one doesn't belong? Pick one corner of the image that you think doesn't belong and make sure you have a reason why. Mark, what's the one corner that you think doesn't belong and why? Audrey, I'm going to choose the bottom left. I choose that that piece does not belong because the shape doesn't look like it's finished. Oh, <laughs> I like that. Um, I noticed that the top left is the only triangle. Ah, that's true. Let's see. Um, oh, yes. In the upper right, that's the only shape with four sides. And also, I, I, could, I could give another reason to that same one not belonging. It's also the only one with four corners or what I might call four angles. Nice. Well, the bottom right, um, the edges on that shape are curved instead of straight. So that one for sure doesn't belong. Mm -hmm. Well, just as before, this routine would look a little different in a classroom or with a group of students. Here are some things you should know. First, each corner has at least one reason it doesn't belong to the other three. Students should consider which corner doesn't belong and why. They can then share their idea with a partner before a whole class share out about which corner doesn't belong and why, where the teacher can record students' responses next to each corner. We would like you to take some time to explore the different examples of a which one doesn't belong task. We have three options here on the screen. On the left-hand side with the which one doesn't belong image, there's a website link there, wodb.ca, where you can explore which one doesn't belong tasks that have pictures, graphs, and um, other examples. In the middle, the image represented by the Google Drive icon has a Google Drive that is uh, brought together of pictures that different educators have taken themselves of which one doesn't belong tasks and uploaded to that drive that you can explore. And on the right hand side, the Twitter image or icon there um, has the follow hashtag WODB, where you can find all kinds of images that folks on that social media platform have posted for others to use. We would encourage you to look at different examples and consider how your learning question might be answered um, with this routine. So please pause the video now for about 10 minutes or until you've had a chance to explore and find an example and feel ready to resume with us. How does this routine of which one doesn't belong build expert learners? Take a moment to consider that question. This routine also reduces barriers and provides access for student thinking. And here's some ways that that happens. First of all, it includes visual representations. It includes multiple access points and multiple solutions. It also provides options for informal language. This routine allows students to use rough draft thinking and rough draft language as they describe the attributes of each shape and why it doesn't belong. The routine also builds on prior learning. Which one doesn't belong allows students to use their prior experience with shapes in their explanations. 
The routine can also be used to build on the prior learning of comparing two things like we did in our previous routine, same and different. This routine also honors student identity. It is accepting of different perspectives. It leverages language and social and cultural capital, embraces a collectivist approach to mathematics. And the collective thinking grows as each person contributes their thinking. As we mentioned in the previous routine, there is a relationship between honor, honoring identity and reducing fear. Consider this quote from Andra Tisha Fritzgerald. A universally designed learning environment invites, protects every member of the community by recognizing each member of the learning community as both valuable and redeemable, regardless of their actions. As teachers, we have the power to reduce the association of fear with math. Let's look specifically about how we do that with this routine. In this routine, we accept and welcome students taking risks and making mistakes. And which one doesn't belong, we reduce the expectation for one right answer. And which one doesn't belong, we eliminate guess what's in the teacher's head questions. We build a collectivist culture and we set an expectation so that each perspective offers new insight for the group. In just a moment, we'll ask you to pause again to consider the learning you have done so far in this session. What understanding have you built towards your learning question at this point in the session? Please pause this recording to write, record, or consider what you've gained so far. As we look at how does this routine, which one doesn't belong, and the implementation of the routine reduce barriers, we want to remind you of what we mean by the routine and implementation. When we talk about the task, again, we mean just the problem, exercise, or question that the students will be engaged in thinking about. You can again think of the task here on the page, the one where we shade in part of the large square and then identify how much of the whole square is shaded. Or you can think of the four teal images that were in the green square we were looking at during the which one doesn't belong routine earlier. When we talk about implementation, we think of these as the teacher moves that surround the task or the routine. They're the questions that the teacher asks, whether or not students are instructed to first talk with a partner and then with the class. If students write their reasons down or if the reasons are written or recorded for students as they share, et cetera. Again, the UDL guidelines can be a great resource for us as we consider the qualities of the routine that align with options provided within one or more of the networks. We can also use one or more of the networks to inform our implementation of the routine. For example, in the routine, which one doesn't belong, there are options that align with the engagement network. This routine has qualities that lower barriers in recruiting interest and sustaining effort and persistence. We can also use the representation network when we implement which one doesn't belong. By looking at this particular network, we can gain ideas about how to reduce barriers for our students as they implement, as they engage in the mathematics. In which one doesn't belong, we can reduce barriers in language and symbols and comprehension as we implement the routine. The examples that I provided were just a couple areas of intersection. Where do you see connections between the routine, which one doesn't belong, and the implementation of the routine with the checkpoints within each of these networks? Please pause the recording to take a moment to consider this.
As we are getting to the end of our time together today, let's take a few minutes to consolidate our learning. First of all, let's remind ourselves of the why. Why instructional routines in mathematics? These routines position the learner as an expert. They help students identify their strengths and areas of, for growth. And they support executive functioning through a repeating structure. And when we implement math routines, we are able to engage students in the behaviors of mathematicians. We are able to honor students and build them up as expert learners. And most importantly, we can reduce the association of the mathematics classroom as a place of fear. Well, we know that learning is never done. And so we would like to offer a few practical next steps that you might consider as you continue to explore the topics presented in today's session. First, we would like to offer that you can continue working towards your learning question. One way to do that might be to explore one of the books that we mentioned in this session. Here are three that you could choose from. On the far left is Tracy Zager's Becoming the Math Teacher You Wish You'd Had. It's great for learning about how you could broaden the definition of mathematics. The middle text is Zaretta Hammond's Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain, which can support your learning around fear, honoring students and their identity, and building a collectivist culture. On the far right is Andra Tisha's Fitzgerald's Anti-Racism and Universal Design for Learning which can support your learning on the connections between UDL and honoring students and reducing the associations of fear. To make this step actionable, we would encourage you to connect with someone else who's also reading the text. Each of these authors offer study guides you can use to start your own book club with a friend. A second thing you could try is you could actually try one of these routines with students. This isn't just for current classroom teachers. All educators can try one of these routines with the class or even with a small group of students or an individual student. To support you in trying these routines, we have a few resources we can offer. First, for what is the same, what is different, we have three resources we'd like to mention. The one that says same or different is a website that has different prompts that can be used for kindergarten through eighth grade and provides the task themselves to have the what is the same and what is different. The book that's titled there, Same But Different by Dr. Sue Looney actually is linked to her blog as well as her book and some examples that she provides for K-12 um, in Same But Different. And lastly, we have the Twitter icon because if you follow the hashtag same diff math, you'll find examples that people on social media platform have shared with other educators. In the which one doesn't belong box, we have the same three links there that we shared with you earlier in a previous slide, as well as a fourth image, which is the book, Which One Doesn't Belong by Christopher Danielson, where we took the example for our routine today. We've only had time to share two of many of the math routines during our time today. So feel free to branch out to other routines if you or a colleague are more familiar with others. To make this action step practical, Name the routine and a group of students you'll try it on with. You can even give a deadline to yourself on your calendar. For example, by the end of August, I'll try this routine at least twice in a second grade classroom. Lastly, you might think that the right size next step for you is to talk with someone who might be willing to be a thought partner. Share your learning question with them and what you've learned so far and what you're still wondering about so that you can continue to learn with and from each other. To make this step a reality, we encourage you to name that person and put a reminder for yourself to set up a time to discuss one or more of these questions. Audrey and I are so grateful for the opportunity to share these ideas with you in this session. We have included our contact information on this slide so we can continue the conversation with you. We send our best wishes as you work to ensure each and every student in your context has the opportunity and support to be successful in mathematics. Take care. <laughs>